so I am Kevin Herbchuk, um, and this is the Seth in Scientific Research Computing, Large Clusters, Birds of a Feather. And that's a very important aspect of this, is like I do not have a presentation. I am facil facilitating a birds of a feather conversation with everybody here, which means hopefully I don't have to talk too much. Um, if you don't know what a birds of a feather session is, basically it's a conversation of people who have a similar interest. Obviously, we all have a similar interest in Ceph. Uh, this is kind of more in scientific and research computing environments. And um, so me personally, I'm uh, from the University of Wisconsin over in the United States um, at the Space Science and Engineering Center. We run Ceph to uh, process satellite data for NASA, basically, for multiple missions. Um, and the whole, this whole um, birds of a feather thing came out of actually Cephalicon 2019, where they had a boards uh, outside in the common area where it was like sign up for an impromptu birds of a feather, and that's what we did. And it turned out to be kind of a success. And so we've kind of now since, you know, Barcelona 2019, every two, three months, we get together and do a virtual meetup online of people you know, obviously Ceph users, but mostly in the scientific community or just large clusters is uh, cloud people. Um, really, it's just honestly anybody. We just chat for one to two hours on the internet and go over what's going on, what's new, upgrades have gone good, bad, bugs you've hit, you know, outages, questions. It's just a forum for us to get together frequently and talk. And so this is hopefully just going to be a successful uh, physical representation of that virtual meeting that we do every two or three months. And so I have two slides. This is my second one. <laughs> um, and hopefully it's just to help facilitate getting this going. Um, there, the QR code there is for, there's a Ceph pad set up. Um, usually we have, if you're interested in joining like the, um, every two, three month virtual meeting. I do send the email out to the Ceph users list, but then I also have like a private list of people who are interested because sometimes it gets lost in the noise of the users list. There's a lot of stuff going on there. I miss things. Um, you can add your e name and email address to that Ceph pad and I can get you put on the private list of notifications for that. Um, the meetup is usually every fourth Wednesday of every couple months um, at 4 p.m. Central European time, and that works out nicely to usually 9 a.m. my time. Uh, so we do get a good crowd of people from the U.S. and Europe uh, joining in. Um, so basically, let's have a discussion. There's a mic here that I can pass around. Maybe we can get another one if we need it. Um, but does anybody want to share like the science and research that they do and how they use Ceph to support it? Please. <laughs> I mean, I could ramble for a while, but I prefer not to. <laughs> This is totally ad hoc. <laughs> so, DUI. DUI.fi. Let's get a new browser. DUI.fi. Is this like a presentation you did at some Yeah, point? it's a presentation. Perfect. It, there is no volume. Uh, I can explain that. Oh, it's not showing. Hold on. You lost you it. Should. So, my name is Pieter Hyperinen. I'm working for CSC, which is owned by Finnish Ministry of Culture and Education and Universities and Applied Sciences. And we are running uh, uh, Lumi O, which is part of the Lumi supercomputer. This is going too fast. Yeah, I can pause it. Start that. So, so uh, our Lumio cluster is around uh, 30 petabytes of usable capacity, so 3,000 OSDs, and we uh, have a problem with the scientific users that they tend to. Could you could you pause that? 
I can, it's easier to say. So they, they would like to uh, share the S3 credentials. That's, that's annoying, because they can lay around everywhere and they, they can get stolen. So we've been using uh, a Swift API for, for our scientific users. But with Lumio, we try to implement uh, other approach for, for this uh, problem. And we are solely providing S3 API. So if you go back, it's too fast without, sorry. Uh, so yeah. there is a, so uh, we made a in-house uh, front end and back end for serving this S3 credentials. So uh, this is utilizing your OAuth2. Uh, so you can play. So there is a different, uh, like my access ID for European users. Haka is uh, our local Finnish uh, Kerber uh, Civilet portal. So I can pick any of science groups that we are having, and then I can log in. And I have uh, CLI for showing some R, R clone for, for you how, how it's working. So some of our chances were that we need to make some uh, screen which is usable also on a, on a lap, laptop and also on a mobile. So that's why I was moving around the, this screen. So. I have a project, there is a project number, and it's for testing. And I can create a S3 credentials valid for four hours. And I can write some uh, key description for, for my key. So I can find that on a later on my GUI. And this, this front end is using the co uh, back end API to actually do the things. And well, you saw my keys. You can take a screenshot and <laughs> log in, right? Well, uh, I can extend my key here with this tool. So I create a four hours uh, tool and or, or the key for my HPC workload. And I wanted to extend that because the work was were uh, going longer than, than expected. And there is also templates for different tools, client-side tools. So this is, for example, is for our clone. So uh, we are creating uh, for our scientific users two ways to use the R clone. So there's a public and private ways. The only difference is the ACL public read and private. So they can, when they are publishing their paper, they will put that uh, paper on a public bucket. And when they are writing something on a private, so they can use them, the S3 credential for their own use. They can use the private key. The, sorry, the, if you move this. In time or forward? Yeah, yeah, now it's fine because you don't see the underlying line. So, in this example, I'm, I'm using the configuration file, make it private and public buckets. This is <coughs> simple enough for our scientific users to use the S3. I, I think that the most problematic thing for uh, adopting object storage is that they don't know how to use it. And well, this is kind of giving them one way to use it. So I'm now copying this file to with our clone to private bucket and and also 
uh, putting that on a, on a public one, hopefully, I don't remember. This was just for our internal training for, for our customers. But you gave me a mic, so I'm <laughs> not <Sorry>. showing you. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, our uh, bucket naming and ten tenants are made in a way that every user has the separate project-based tenant. So they can use freely the same name namespace for for their own buckets so I had the uh, big public bucket but everyone else if you log in and create your project you can have the same bucket or you can have the temp bucket which is not good but you can still use the temp bucket as a folder and as you can see, you cannot log in or see on a normal web browser my private bucket because it's uh, only the R clone ACL is preventing that when, when the scientific user is using that. And as you can see, with the R clone, uh, the file is there. It's usable on the R clone tool, for example, here. And it's it's also on a, on a public side, so I think that I am showing that also. No, I didn't show that. Sorry, but then there is a way to delete the key, and there is already expired key that that it shows that it's expired, so it's free to delete. But but I can. When I, when I have done this presentation, I can delete the key and it's gone. And uh, background tool is uh, taking care of the expiring the keys. So there is a daemon which we have done in-house to make sure that th this logic works. I know that there is other ways to do this, but this is kind of foolproof or foolproof enough for scientific users. <laughs> Any questions? Thanks. Uh, yeah, that's really interesting. And I think, as you say, trying to give S3 to scientific users, I think I feel like we all hit exactly the same problem, and this solves it quite nicely. Um, yeah, as you say, you're doing the key expiry, um, not ma I don't mean manually, but like you're not using, for instance, the secure token service stuff. Um, did you consider doing that, or was this before that? Actually, the primary idea was using the security token service, but we end up hitting the problems with our scientific super support guys that the client tools were not able to use that uh, token properly. Uh, Some were, but we end up problems that you have to write your own Boto tree tools for for making the use of it. So we really tried to use that. That was on a scope, and it was really interesting. We made some uh, proposal for fixing some things on our Rados gateway side, also with that. This is just the uh, client side uh, tool, which is accessing our a backend API. Uh, I can help with doing that on your on your site if you're interested. It's not big magic. Sorry, not a question, but a shout out because uh, it's the, I think, third case where uh, somebody needs uh, management over S3 to manage like quotas, keys, whatever. And if anybody wants to join forces to make like an API that is open source, maybe upstream, 
to how to manage this effectively for organizations, please find me, we can try something. It's a great example of how our meetings go, just random talking about stuff. Um, anybody else have any fun, interesting clusters, horror stories recently of a bad upgrade or something interesting, sciencey or cloudy or whatever? There's got to be a few people in here. Am I off for a minute? Every now and then we see a spike in, in, in the data volume and in, in and then we go scratch our neck and, okay, who misbehaved this time and where did it happen? And we have a huge directory tree and then we go to you here and there and uh, it's not a, not a sort of graceful way of, of addressing this problem when, whenever it occurs. Um, I'm sure I'm not the only one. What's, what's the clever way to do uh, with this problem? I mean, quotas could be one way, but that still doesn't prevent entirely that you see uh, undesirable, unexpected uh, volume growth. User education will. Uh, <laughs> eventually, I suppose that will help, but that's going to be like in an eternity. <laughs> Yeah, keep, keeping, keeping that beast on a short leash. Not really sure how. Open question. If anybody thinks of any answer for him, please find him. Um, uh, Anybody else have anything interesting, sciencey, large cluster, whatever? I know it's hard following up CERN, but I call them out to say something, but Dan just did a good job at describing what they've done the past 10 years. I've got sort of got a general uh, conversation point, something that's a bit of a, comes up a lot for us when we're running a larger cluster, and that's See, being able to do rolling reboots and rolling upgrades is really nice, but it, the bigger the cluster gets, the more painful it becomes. Um, things, like, things like rolling reboots and major version upgrades. Um, and so maybe just wanted to ask people that are running bigger Ceph clusters, um, not just for research, but I often feel that people that are running stuff for research, it, and lag behind a bit on going to the latest version, et cetera. What sort of versions are people running um, for, their, for their big clusters? Um, and how, how have they found the upgrade process? And particularly, I guess a lot of people are thinking about major, well, thinking about OS version upgrades at the moment as well. Um, that's been a big topic, and I think it can be harder to do on the bigger clusters. Does anybody want to talk about that? I, I guess I guess we can start. Um, yeah, yeah. So our um, our big cluster, um, which is around 200 nodes, um, is still a uh, Red Hat Seven uh, derivative, um, and is running Nautilus, um, and it's bare metal. Um, the upgrade process in front of us. I'm not entirely sure what it looks like. We can upgrade to opt. Yeah, Terra. Um, we can upgrade to Octopus fairly easily, that's my understanding. Um, but once we've hit Octopus, you can't. There are, there are no packages uh, for Red Hat 7 derivatives um, past Octopus, so then it's a major OS upgrade, um, and then onwards. And then it's, do you go to something 8, or do you go straight to something 9? Um, have other people been thinking about this? I just went through that. that was on, I started on Octopus and a mix of EL8 and EL7. And 
it's not, but we just had to one by one go through and redo all the EL7 host to EL8. But we did the, a procedure to do it without removing, migrating any data. You know, you just kickstart it without wiping all your disks, just SDA, and you know, we, we then just installed the latest version of whatever uh, it was Octopus for that. Um, not doing a staff upgrade at the same time, maybe a minor release. Um, and then we could do a node in about 90 minutes. Um, bring it down, kickstart it, bring it back up, let the cluster get healthy again, and you know, we only have about 60 nodes or so, and maybe half of them were EL7. And it took a while, but we got it done. And now we can finally go to Pacific, <laughs> which was the goal. <laughs> yep. And on that, did you have any problems running mixed? Mixed uh, OS? Mixed OS? Yeah. None at all. Uh, not to share any experience, but just to ask, how do you deal with uh, when you have maintenance constraints? Like in our case, we our safe cluster is supporting the the accelerator, so we have very short maintenance window, uh, except uh, during summer time where we have two weeks, but two weeks might not actually be enough to. Uh, Upgrade everything, update the OS, and have the cluster rebalanced and you know backfilled. So, do you have similar issues, and how do you deal with that? So you have like a very small maintenance window to do any sort of OS upgrade or whatever. Yeah. Um, ideally, your crush map allows you to take a host down without anybody noticing any impact to the cluster. Is what I would think, and just work within your failure domain to do them and. In theory, that maintenance win window shouldn't apply, but I come from a world where I can just do anything anytime to my self clusters and don't have customers, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little lucky. Yes, so the failure domain is the fun one for us because we have the our 200 storage nodes and the failure domain at host level. Indeed. And it takes like two weeks to reboot the whole thing, which is a bit sad whenever patches. So I'd be interested to know if people are running clusters at large scale with, I've got the failure domains at host level, or how are they handling that problem? Is that a manual reboot you do of everything, or is it automated? Shut down minus RF now. <laughs> a while back, I wrote a nice Python script that would do that for me. It would actually do your whole cluster upgrade, and then I accidentally rebuilt the host the Python script was living on, and now yeah, I didn't I mean, have a copy is, anywhere. <laughs> this is just OS patching, which is yeah. every three to six months. Yeah, but I think there's room for automation for that. And it looks there like is. with Ceph ADM, they're working on getting that a little better, which would be great. Yeah, we don't, in, well, we're not, on, we're not using Ceph ADM yeah, yet, because either. we're a bit <laughs> terrified of, our, of putting it on our large cluster, but we'll see how that, but if, <laughs> We haven't, we haven't thought about this for a couple of years yet, so. <laughs> yes. I mean, this is my white whale of trying to find <laughs> space in our maintenance schedule to get that done. I, I can tell a previous question a, a bit. Uh, we, are, we have a fifth uh, maybe, maybe five production clusters currently running uh, from Firefly up to the Quincy. So not, not, not the Firefly is not there yet anymore, but, but, the, uh, <laughs> but the life has gone up from fry, Firefly. So you can expect that the, our operating system has gone all, all the time up. And with the CentOS, till the CentOS 8, we've been using quite successfully the path and and we we uh, now have switched to a CentOS 8 stream May, you might think that I'm extreme but we have minimized uh, all the ma possible packages that we are deploying on a, on a, on operating system and we first do the upgrade on the CentOS 8 stream because then there is a Python tree support and things like that. And then after that, you can go to Octopus or something from the Nautilus. Not 
not in a way that you are, you are running CentOS 7 and CentOS 8 and CentOS 9 or there's something Red Hat or Zeus, but, but, but upgrade your operating system first on a higher level and then, then go forward with the, with the later releases. Sorry. No, no problem. I'm, I mean, I think over the last 13 years, we um, developed multiple times um, complete pipelines to, uh, to the upgrade of not only Ceph nodes, also compute nodes in the good old open Nebula days and open stack days and Kubernetes and so on. Um, I mean, of course, the Ceph, we have to find an approach how we can up, keep up, not only for the Ceph nodes, also for the compute nodes we're talking about perhaps in, in one location, 1,200 um, servers or something like this. And um, what you did the first time, I think even 10 years ago, it was done with Puppet. Then, then we um, took Ironic, adapted it with some Ansible scripts as well, that we also can have a complete a full pipeline. Um, that's also uh, do the firmware updates um, of, the, um, of the servers and so on. And um, for, for really critical systems that we never can bring down because we never have a, uh, a maintenance window, you have to do it on, on the, yeah, you have to replace every node. So drain it out, move it into the pipeline. First, you upgrade the operation system if possible. Yeah, I mean, that's manual work to check if this really is a good idea. And then if you have done this, all of this work, then you can start to upgrade the Ceph cluster. Um, yeah. And now, now we do it, I think, since three years, we somehow tried to follow this immutable infrastructure approach as well. I mean, that's the ideal idea how we can, should, perhaps we'll do it in the future, but we have always this, when, when there's something ongoing like this, a really, yeah, really bad or high security vulnerability, then we have also the, the ability to apply it directly and not um, do this immutable, immutable infrastructure approach. And if perhaps I missed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, 13 years ago we did it manually. So, and then and then you realize, okay, this um, server was upgraded by this guy, and this one was the, you you have seen it there. So. Yeah. But it's always a lot of work to do. Yeah, that's to prepare everything. So, so. someone else? Maybe. Uh, so we run um, Kubernetes and containers, and I will probably consider that option as well because it sounds like it solves some of your problems, especially around the packages. Or is there anyone? Yeah, but um, if you want, for example, to be safe, you can implement health checks in Kubernetes and maybe then, don't know if that's a hard part to overcome for you. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I have uh, some oper uh, some <laughs> some experience operating clusters, and your host level uh, redundancy that's uh, something that has happened to me also. So, <laughs> uh, one of the things is you can just reinstall the operating system without moving any data. So, because you, if you're using LVM, uh, all the yeah yeah. So then, this is not a problem. Yeah, I mean, it's getting to the scale where even even with rolling, even with, with doing rolling reboots, rolling reinstalls, um, it's it, it just eventually starts taking longer and longer. Um, and so the yeah, the dream of transitioning it all smoothly to rack level failure domains. Yeah. Yeah. Then we can just take that whole rack. 
Yeah, it's 200 nodes with another 160 wrecked and ready to go. So that's <laughs> at some... Yeah, yeah, I mean, that, that is always an option, I guess. It just, it, feel, it feels like there are enough wrecks for wreck level failure domain to be there that they should be there. Whether it's a good idea or not, it's possibly... possibly. Oh, yeah. Can you change crush to be a wreck level failure domain without upsetting things at this point, or...? So, the, with the way it is currently that the racks are not in the crush map, um, so it, so there's... So you'd have to do it, that? It, yeah, in, in my head you can, there are a bunch of steps you can do adding racks in um, without changing the crush rule. Yeah. Um, you might get data movement, but then you can just upmap, remap everything back into place. Um, the spooky bit is then the actually changing the crush rule. <laughs> it's always um, a spooky bit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. D D Dan had a good suggestion that you start with effectively virtual racks, so you have a rack for every host, um, and so you can change to rack level failure domain, and then you can just, again, you'll probably get data movement, but you can just upmap, remap it, and then you can just slowly move host by host into the real Oh, sure. Buckets. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. definitely clever. <laughs> My suggestion if we just do it and see what happens was... Uh, was Can you give him the mic? <laughs> yeah, we have, we have only around 60 OSD hosts, um, and we took a deep breath and enabled the bit. And I was very... I mean, there, there's no preview that I know of of what's going to happen. I, I didn't know if it would go basically belly up for two weeks or what. Um, it was uh, surprisingly little uh, impact. I mean, there was no impact at all on, on, on usage. Of, I mean, I didn't hear any complaints. And it was done in, I think, in a few days or so, or yeah, four days or something. But there is much better solution that, you know, get Yeah, in your case, you, are, you, you have quite a large cluster. Yeah. It, it did go very high, maybe not 100, but, but I mean, way be beyond 50. Um, um, I'm not a Rook user, but one of the use cases I've used it for is uh, exactly this, trying to change crush rules and see what happens. So I'm, I'm just making a system that is the same as the production system with all the same, like a replica, and then I try and see what happens, because the only way of actually figuring that out is trying, and I don't want to do that on my live clusters. But, but how could you replicate uh, It's just all the OSDs and all the hosts, like running uh, just those processes. You, you don't really, really need the actual data to see what happens. So we can just have like some kilobytes of data and that's, you'll see like what happens. I think a few years ago we wrote, we extended this, this crush map tool, um, even that we can um, pre see how much data would be uh, is, is misplaced and so on. I think, I, 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 it, I can't remember exactly, but we had the same problem with it in a smaller cluster, 600 OSDs, pure rotationals, and we said it's better to remove uh, to move the OSDs out and put it somewhere else in, instead of waiting that um, everything should be um, um, backfilled. So, but I think we have this, so you even don't need a root cluster for it. Have to check, it's, it's a few, it's, four years ago. I got the impression from uh, the previous talk or one of the talks that uh, the PG up mapping could solve this issue, no? Yeah. Yeah. Make, make a bunch of changes, like radical crush map changes, and then provided, provided they're not Provided the current mappings are still legal, um, you can just put everything back in, in place. So for stuff where you're making complete changes um, and which results in everything being moved, you can then just upmap everything back in place. Um, where it originally was, yeah. and then slowly release the other. Yeah. But where that doesn't help you is 
if you actually like if you actually wanted to have rack level failure domains when that, when that final change is made there's no there's no way the current mappings can can exist um, so you you up, you'll try and put the up map in and it will just disappear Since you're going to play around with your cross map really soon, uh, think if you can s virtually split your racks in a way that you don't, in the end, using a whole rack as a one. Because you might like six OSD servers per virtual rack. Well, then you can have a eraser encoded pools with a more than just four plus three replicas or things like that. Well, that's not the problem then, but. <laughs> well, the reason to use a whole rack specifically is because the networking, the net, there's a top of rack switch, and you won't be able to turn that thing off and on again, or have it fail or whatever, and have nothing <coughs> bad happen. I mean, uh, the virtual rack um, idea should generally work. We were able to move clusters with the virtual rock sort of thing without downtimes. And in general, if you're doing, um, I mean, if you start with 200 virtual racks and then start, I mean, merging, if you start divide and conquer, you can do it with minimal data movement, but still, when you have 200, who said the failure domain, you'll still, I mean, you cannot avoid some amount of data movement, but you can just, I mean, divide the amount of data movement you do with virtual racks and stuff yeah. before going to a physical rack domain. All right, well, I think like it's the booth crawl time anyways here. Um, Thanks for the session and not making me sit up here and ramble the entire time. Uh, but that, if you're interested, like that is exactly what we get online and talk about every couple months for an hour or two. Um, just people talking to other people about solving problems or sharing clever ideas to help with stuff, um, to help other people get along. And you know, this is often like when you're running at these scales of like you know anywhere from these clusters are a petabyte all the way up to. 40, 50, 60 petabytes at scale, funny things happen, and it's good to be in contact with other people who are doing those same things, or like, you know, let's process, let's throw a 4,000 compute cores at CephFS and see what happens, and you know, stuff like that, and it's good to talk to the other people who do that stuff. Um, so if you're interested, like I said, you can toss your email on the QR code, CephPad, the link's up at the top too, and um, join us sometime. This is all just a promo for that. <laughs> and uh, you got something quick to say? One last question. Do you keep like meeting notes or like a wiki where we could share these? Do you, out of these meetings, do you, do you have like meeting notes or make maybe a wiki page where we could share our, our tryings and findings around that kind of topic? Yeah, there's actually like a, um, um, that QR code is a link to that one, but there's actually like a, another pad that's like an index of basically every meeting we've ever had. Um, I can copy that link and to that pad uh, if you're interested, basically. The, that's where all the notes and stuff is at. Okay, well, thank you, and I guess let's go have a booth crawl and a drink or two.